last talk, we um, didn't know it was going to be quite so formal, so uh, we'll do our best to uh, uh, speak clearly and speak well. Um, if we're too quiet or too fast or um, you don't understand anything that we're saying, please do uh, feel free to talk to us as well if you want to. Um, so we are, uh, I'm Daniel. I'm Eleanor. Hello. I'm Tim. Um, me and Eleanor, we co-direct a company called Thick and Tight, and we've been invited, well, we were invited three years ago to respond to uh, No Theatre, so we've created a work uh, that we're going to be performing tonight, alongside performing with the No Actors and Musicians in the final work, and Tim is a designer of a set and costume that we've been working with for about four years, something like that. Yeah and has designed the costumes that will be uh, adorning this evening. Um, we've been running Thick and Tight for about 10 years now. Um, we work with mime and dance and drag and lip syncing and theatre. We sort of mix together lots of different art forms. We trained originally in um, Balling Contemporary at Rombert, um, and we began making work for little sort of scratch nights and small spaces and We've gone on to, to work in lots of uh, um, major theatres in Britain. And uh, yeah, it's a real privilege to be presenting work here at Thanks. Do you want to say a bit about it? Uh, yeah, and um, I'm a, a, a designer and I'm also an artist and sculptor, painter. Um, and the thing that kind of links all of those things uh, for me is, is kind of always a kind of investigation of materials and what they do. So whether that's in a painting or in this case in a in a costume, it's it's a kind of um, what do certain materials do in relation to in this case um, bodies. Um, and so a few years ago, it must have been in 2019, we were doing a performance as part of the London International Mime Festival. And we never trained in mime, but somehow because we do quite a lot of lip sync and quite a lot of character based uh, and it often quite comic work, it turns out, it seemed to fit within this mime uh, festival world. And so I think Akiko and Helen, who uh, runs the King's Place, um, saw that show and thought that um, we would be a good fit for responding to. Uh, Kyogen Theatre, which is um, part of the No realm and is often a, it's a shorter piece of work that's more of an interlude. So I'm sure some of you know this already, so forgive me for uh, telling those who know. Um, but it's uh, often satirical and comic and uh, a kind of more lighthearted uh, relief in some way from a longer, more concentrated work. Um, and so Akiko uh, invited us to make some work. Uh, I don't know quite how, um, I think we might have gone down more of a serious <laughs> route than we uh, intended and than perhaps uh, Akiko intended. Um, but yes, it's just been uh, so wonderful to, uh, to be learning about the art forms and how we can uh, think about um, <coughs> responding to it. And so to begin with, we um, did a lot of initial research because we didn't know anything about No before or Kyogen. Um, and so we did a lot of reading and looking at uh, videos and uh, trying to understand about the history of the art form. But in a wider sense, we did, um, we both identify as queer, and that is a very important part of our um, company's work and the work that we do. Um, and so that was something that we wanted to think about in uh, relation to No and, and Kyogen and what we were going to perform. So we wanted to learn a little bit about queer culture in Japan as well, and thinking a bit about how uh, queer culture might have a different um, understanding of national boundaries and, and nationality, um, and how it might be related to different histories in different ways. So we did, um, yeah, we, were, we talked to lots of people, we did lots of interviews um, with people who were very generous and very helpful with their um, thoughts and these are people who um, are either connected to know in some way or are, um, I suppose, in a similar 
way to us perform within a, a kind of cabaret queer nightlife um, realm, but are of Japanese heritage and art we were trying to find out how that um, affected their work that they made or how they felt it was viewed. Um, and we were also thinking a lot about how to respond to such a respected art form of Japan as people who are white and how we can do it in a way that doesn't appropriate um, but feels relevant to the work and is somehow contributing uh, something. Um, so that was a big part of lots of discussions we were having um, and has actually had a huge impact on our company and how we are set up now in terms of, um, yeah. yeah. Just on that word queer, I, I mean, I, I don't think uh, no performers would describe it as queer, but the people that we've trained with have explained to us that, well, no, there's these plays where there's two men who are in love with each other, or even the other day, that there's a male god and an old man who look at each other from a distance, and then one of them becomes pregnant by the other one. So there's all the, and lots of, um, you know, men performing as women. So it, it wasn't that we were sort of uh, stamping our identity on top mm. of no, it actually arose from it already. As yes. soon as you look into it, you go, ah, there's such an art form that we can really connect uh, our, our, our understandings into uh, a, a very ancient understanding of what uh, non-binary or uh, outsider way of thinking about. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I think that you should carry on talking about um, the, this sense of uh, cross-cultural research that we were doing and the first residency that we did. Yes, so we were really lucky. The first residency we got, we went to Snake Mortons and we had a residency for a week. Uh, it was to study Curly River by Benjamin Britten. So we spent... The snake is in Aldborough in Suffolk and it's a, a place that was set up by the composer Benjamin Britten um, uh, as a place to, as a concert hall, and a place that he wrote music where he lived. Uh, and his music is that area of the world, isn't it? It's, it's the sound of the sea there, it's the sound of the east coast, it's the sound of the marshes. So we spent time there um, looking into the archives and looking into the very early beginnings of how he began writing this church parable, which is based on a no play which he uh, shifted into a, a sort of Christian story, but it's, it's the same characters that you find in this um, well-known no play. And then the other part of the residency, we, uh, we went out into the marshes um, with recorders to try and record the elusive curly bird, which lives among marshes, which proved <laughs> to be very difficult. Every, every time we would stand there for about two hours waiting, <laughs> go like that, and then we'd pack it all up, and then a busted curly would just turn <laughs> up and squawk, and then, and then off it. So um, it, was, it was lovely being out in the marshes, and just the, it was also connecting to the fact that curly lives in those marshes, and it also lives in Japan. And, and, it, and then also what, um, it led us on to in, in the future of the work is that uh, it, the calls that it makes at night and it's haunting and there's there's a feeling of um, because it's dual something that it's um, it's cool oh, it's it's um, a full tone and a half tone at once yes which which uh, is it, it's a haunting sound so immediately it sort of put us on track to create something that felt more haunting than and if you see the piece later, you'll see a few little um, curlews in there, if you look closely. Uh, also, that they're, they're a very endangered species, which connects into um, what we've also been studying, which is a, a topic called queer ecology. It's a new sort of academic research. Yes, I'll talk a bit more about that. But first, I just wanted to add to that that um, Tim joined us for this residency and um, as well as uh, being part of the design of the work, you've also been feeding into the choreographic 
language of it as well. And I remember you really helping us think about how to feel, uh, sort of embody the landscape of you know, the marshes and the um, verticality of all the reeds and the, the act, which was. Well, it's, I suppose something to say just about, sort of about that is, is just how long we th this project has been going on for because of various sort of lockdowns and things. Um, it sort of protracted the whole process. So, that, so yes, I'm, I've forgotten that I was there, yeah. and that was a whole other kind of bit of the research. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's wonderful to be doing that residency in such a particularly beautiful natural um, environment, um, and because the the theme we were given to, to work from is uh, nature unwrapped and. As Sano Sensei was saying yesterday in the introductory talk, um, he was saying that in no, the attitude to, to nature is not to put humans above uh, nature as a kind of um, higher, higher ranking being than other elements within nature, and those are connected there definitely with uh, queer ecology, which is looking at nature and biology and understandings of how life works. Uh, through a lens of queer, queer theory, which we have read some of, and uh, there's plenty more to, to be learning. But there's something also within that idea that that you don't have to think of life as a sort of pyramid with a, a straight white man at the top, and then sort of going down out through anyone who isn't a straight white man, and then gradually to you know a horse and a dog, and then a mouse and a rat. and that there's a sort of hierarchy but to not think of it like that and I remember hearing an amazing fact which I can't remember the exact details of and maybe if you know you can uh, tell me but it's something about the number of cells in your body something like 70% of the cells Absolutely. in or on your body don't they're not actually you then there are other beings so yeah with that just sound amazing um, so it's also thinking about what natural means and what, um, when particularly related to um, people's sexuality or gender identity, what is um, considered natural and normal and allowed within a society. And I think particularly in the West, mm -hmm. it became, it has become very limited and, um, and a kind of right and a wrong or a good and a bad and a, and a consistent sort of binary of, of male and female or straight or you know um, so I think it's understanding that um, <coughs> not using nature as a way to go oh this in the animal kingdom that doesn't happen there's a male and a female and they reproduce and that is how life cycles happen because obviously it doesn't really work like that um, and so it's not yeah using nature against people to try and make them seem wrong or that they're not allowed to exist how they are so that's sort of under that way of thinking, it underpinned our idea of who we could be on stage and what we would be to each yes, other. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, is that, well, we could, do you want to talk about worlds? Yeah, let's, let's do that first. That. So, so we, during the first lockdown, we, we would meet every Monday and we would, um, Zoom. on Zoom <laughs> to try and keep to try and keep our brain cells going and some creativity and we thought oh let's let's try and create together let's let's work on this this piece so what we would do is we would set rules um, about 10 rules about how we could move or how we could work and that came from trying to understand what no was which is this really long ancient tradition and we we knew that we couldn't just copy no, but what we wanted to what we wanted to create was a sense of tradition in the movement and the form that we were creating. So we so what we thought was, well that's rules, that's coming up with lots of ways that you're you can and you can't do things, which helped us create idiosyncratic uh, movement and, and design. So um Tim joined that and that's nice, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I think something we share as artists is that we probably
they all love rules and limitations and like they're I'm learning to like them. That's someone who breaks the book. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know, for, for me that way of working is just so exciting because it's sort of like you're, you're making something without knowing what it's going to be. You're just sort of following the rules. You set the rules and then you follow them. And then this thing just sort of happens out of that. And it's not, it doesn't feel like it's coming from you. Um, I remember, so some of the rules that, so these two are sort of setting each other rules which would generate movement, and then I kind of joined those things and sort of followed the same rules, but made drawings instead, and those drawings would sort of then became initial designs for the costumes. But they also became movement, and so we would replicate the images that you've drawn. Um, yeah, so yeah. It's, it was sort of circular. And the rules were, I mean, some of them were quite, some of them were kind of rhythms from no, I seem to remember, uh, some of them were rhythms of these really beautiful names of moths, like very, very long names of moths. Uh, so using those rhythms, <coughs> those spoken rhythms. Um, I remember there was another rule about kind of always being aware of where the moon was, yes. the, or your imagination of where the moon was when you're moving, and other rules about things like your face is on the back of your head. So they're kind of really, some of them were quite kind of concrete, and others were, much, were sort of more, more poetic. And those things could sort of be translated in all sorts of ways. Yes, and some were kind of more um, choreographic, I suppose, in a in a bodily sense that you know you can turn your head this way and this way, but, but not this way and this way, or you have to have one arm in front and one arm behind, um, or you can only ever you can't make your legs straight or something, just so that it really limits what you can do. Um, and through all those rules, we gradually came up with what the piece would be, because we enjoyed some of those rules a lot. So moths, we decided we would be moths. And then we, we thought, oh, actually, it'd be lovely if the moth was at the back of us. And then we thought, well, the moth has to move forward. So we decided we would have to move back the whole time during the whole piece. Um, and yeah, so that's sort of where the moths came. And then looking into queer ecology, this thing about two moths in real time, it's it's more, the, the piece that you watch, if you're going to watch it later, it's more about if you look up and you see two moths around the light, it's, it's just that. It's not, a, it's not a story about the life cycle of a moth. It's about looking at nature for 15 minutes and just seeing it be. And it's held within the frame of a, of a known stage that um, we'll get to. Mm -hmm. um, Um, so we, Danny and I do lots of other, um, what's been so amazing about this is that originally we were supposed to be making something in about three months and then it got postponed by a year, then it got postponed by another year, and then another year, I can't remember how many years it's been, but what's been amazing is that we have um, been able to keep this, all these things, all this thinking in our minds as we do all the other work that we do. So. Um, there were a couple of occasions where we were working with students, for example, a group of um, students at the Northern School of Contemporary Dance in Leeds, and we were um, that we were using that opportunity to to share what we were learning about No with them and hear their responses, and um, and share this these, these ways of working with the rules that we were coming up with, which we now apply to sort of everything that we do. Mm. Um, and also some other students who we were working with in lockdown on making a film that was about sort of nocturnal um, animals and, and uh, nightlife, yes. human nightlife. Um, so yeah, it's been a, it's really fed through into everything that we do with what part of the um, privilege of being asked to do something so wonderful as this is that it's been amazing to try and share it out with as many people that we interact with as possible. I think yes. it's, So lighting and stage and music um, and costume. Mm. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the the costumes that you'll see um, if, if you see the show are sort of I I think came sort of from three different places. And the first of those places were these with the with the 
drawings and the, the other and and the movement responses to the tasks that we made in lockdown. And I sort of got those drawings that weren't really meant to be designed, but then I sort of looked at them as if they were meant to be designed and kind of tried to you know, as if I was someone else having to make this costume. What, you know, what, what do these things mean if these were designed for for a um, for a costume for a dance? Um, and then another place that they came from is just millions of it, like these amazing pictures of moss that we we're all sending back and forth between us and just how when you look at a moss close up how extraordinary it is and the millions of different textures and that really sort of outrageous combinations of colours that they are. Um, and when you think you've seen the most beautiful one, there's another one that's even more extreme. Uh, so it's sort of working with some of those kind of furries and see through messes and kind of glow in the dark qualities of things and textures. And then um, the third place that the uh, third bit of research really that led to the costumes was um, was some work that we all did with this um, fashion researcher, among other things, called Karina Tanabi Jones. Um, and we just spent some time together researching um, mainly costume from no theatre. Um, and just some of the kind of, I mean, just some. So these costumes sort of have like, look nothing like no or Kyogen costumes at all, but it's sort of tri so some of the things I was really excited about learning in those things was were things just like the enormous volumes of fabric that these costumes um, are constructed of in order to make these really kind of um, uh, graphic shapes, and then then another thing are all these kind of all the layers that go into them and there's a huge sort of um, protocol about dressing before the no Kyogen performance. And all these layers that you don't really see, but these bits of padding that just adjust the um, silhouette of the actor in very subtle ways. And then you put another layer on top of it, and then another layer on top of that. Um, so I was really excited by those things, but also I kind of wanted to see the body through all this stuff. Um, so that, that was kind of the strange act of translation I did. So these costumes are very sort of folded, but they're made out of this fabric, which also comes from um, from sort of moth qualities and moonlight qualities. Um, so you can see the body inside them, but they're also made of kind of this much fabric that's kind of brought into nothing, basically. Um, yeah. Um, music for it, we, we Oh, yeah, it's, 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 so um, we worked with a wonderful lighting designer called Mel Nagai, who is, uh, I don't think she's here, is she here? No. She's not here now. Um, but <laughs> she's, um, she's uh, well, you'll see how she's um, designed uh, a frame that sort of marks out the no stage, which is square, and the uh, Hashikikari, which is the, um, have I pronounced that right? It's the, it's okay, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, it's the uh, kind of bridge between the, the entrance, the door, and and the stage, and so it marks that out as well. And um, three lights, <coughs> three lights for the three trees that go along the bridge, um, and the one at the top, which is sort of representative of the point of the top of the um, stage, and. Neon is also it's it's nightlife and it's attracting insects to it. Um, and then with the music, we started with Benjamin Britten, and I think originally we thought, oh, let's let's try and do loads of Curly River, but but it didn't feel right. And and, and then it felt more exciting to research lots and lots of music that had been written by Japanese people mm -hmm. and, and music that inspired non-Japanese people. Particularly, yeah. Yeah, particularly music that was um, sort of Western and Japanese mutually influenced, um, like John Cage, for example, being very much influenced by uh, 
Japanese music and Japanese Zen Buddhism culture more widely. Stop housing at the end. And um, yeah, and also then thinking uh, like a beautiful bit of a uh, singer called Akihiro Miwa, um, who's, a, who's a drag performer um, and very beautiful, wonderful voice and a, a sort of yeah, so it was, I suppose it was music that referenced all the different elements that we've been researching yeah. throughout, and um, rhythms and nature and sound. And yes, yeah. I think it's it's to create a, a soundscape that sounded ancient, but also really current and yes. and, and and from now as well. Yeah. Um, so that was wonderful to put that um, all together, uh, that sound bit. Uh, and then we were lucky enough to to take a trip to Japan earlier this year. We got um, we got uh, funding to go there, so we travelled to Tokyo and Kyoto, and then we went up into the uh, Gi Mountains, and then down to the coast, and then to Yokohama, um, and it was it was absolutely amazing. It was a trip of a lifetime. And while we were there, we were lucky enough to, to train in uh, Kyogen. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we trained with uh, Sensibora Shigeyama, who is a very well respected Kyogen uh, performer who's based in Kyoto. And so we arrived, and we'd actually already started on Zoom because we were okay, enough, supposed to go years ago. Um, so we'd, we had met a bit, but uh, it was amazing. We were in his studio, which is in his house. Training with him and him teaching us those basic uh, movement uh, rules, I suppose, uh, patterns and understanding of posture, and also thinking a bit more about the philosophical approach as well, and um, talking about representing uh, non-human life through through movement, through a kind of character-based movement. Um, and we were lucky because we went for moths and actually moths aren't in any no plays as far as we've been told. There's mosquitoes and there's butterflies and there's no moths, so um, it's going to be the first. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, so yes, that was that was wonderful to to have that experience and we hope to continue learning mm -hmm. about no Kyoto well into the future. Yeah. Uh, and then so here uh, this evening we've been invited to perform in the last piece of work alongside the um, actor and musicians. So we will be dancing with live music to traditional, no, oh no, it's not traditional, he says. It's it newly composed. It's newly composed. Uh, you can hear it, it's a yeah. composed. Yes, uh, it's absolutely amazing. And uh, collaborating with the uh, recorded player, Piers Allen, who's uh, extraordinary as well. They sound wonderful together, and so it's been And, and uh, as far as we're aware, it feels like rehearsals are not a thing that uh, we, we rehearse and we rehearse and rehearse. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more kind of like, okay, we've had a, is that enough? And is that all? <laughs> so, um, but I think we're on top of it. We're on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> we said, please, can we have, you know, it was a sound recording, so we, we dissected all of the beats and we tried to get it all correct, yeah. and I think, I think we've got it right. Um, but it's really, ex it's really exciting to learn a piece of music that sounds very, very distant from what we would normally create to create something that um, honors it. So, yeah. Yes. Um, I think we've got a little bit of time if anyone has any questions um, to ask. Don't feel any pressure if you would rather go and get to there. Hello. <laughs> oh. Well, I think it was just sort of coming from in, imagining you could, that you were seeing that way, and that your whole sort of direction is that way instead of that way. Yes. So there will be a face. There will yeah. be a face. Well, our, our normal face would be because you know it's about wearing masks, and we thought we we, we can't wear a mask, but so the mask will be behind us, and you'll see a couple of. Sort of furry, can I say, 
Yeah, yeah. A couple of eyes, and then a big um, proboscis that will be sticking out the back. Yeah, so the whole the whole piece we move we move backwards, so the moth is always moving forwards. So if you can sort of forget our faces, you hopefully you'll see two moths moving forward the whole time. We try not to poke each other's eyes out. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of the, what was the second one? The moth, 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 moth. Oh, well, what we didn't realise because we asked people about moths, and a lot of people said they didn't like moths, mm-hmm. and, and and I think there's a real there's a there's a real connection to the to the night time and the fear around the night time, and I sort of didn't I, I sort of didn't get it, and then we we stayed we stayed on sort of in the jungle f- for a few days with this family that lived off the land, um, they were amazing, and at night we went, oh, let's, let's go down to the wood, and it was this very, this wood that was dense, incredibly dense, um, and we got to the edge of it, and it sounded incredibly loud, toads, just everything going on, and then we walked into it slightly, and it went really quiet, yeah. and then it was just suddenly this feeling of, Absolute fear, <laughs> absolute terror, <laughs> and then I, and then I shone my light, and the sky was filled, filled with with bugs, and then Eleanor saw a, a flying squirrel go over her head, and I went, "Quick, let's get inside." <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, I think yeah, the moth, the moth. I think we. Well, I suppose also that it comes back to queer ecology again, and thinking about uh, why why this particular creature is feared and distrusted and disliked and, and how that is also then put on, on humans and, and, and that connection again. Yeah. And my mum, 
I can't make it because of the rail strike. But she read, she did a uh, wonderful, she's a ceramicist, and she made, uh, she made 83 moth brooches, and we left them and gave them to people around Japan. And it's to signify the amount of species of moths that have been lost in Britain in recent years. Um, and I think it, it's there, there's such a quiet, um, unassuming um, part of the natural world, but there doesn't seem like they're going to be around for that long. So it's lovely to do a piece about quiet, what was I saying? But when we did it at the Barbican, um, uh, Eleanor had got COVID the day before we did a week long run. And I, I said to my mum, I said, oh, it's such a shame Eleanor couldn't do it, but she's so refined, she did it so beautifully. And I performed it as a solo my mum went, oh, but there's big furry moths as well. <laughs> 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 We better run and get ready for the show. Thanks so much for coming to listen to us.